It's, uh, it's, not, it's not just that we're talking about the same text, that there's so many recurrent themes today, but um, my, my paper also, the first line I wrote is that this is a, a theological thought experiment. Um, I'm trained in theology, but I work as a priest, which means that I don't necessarily get to read as much theology as I would enjoy, but I do get to spend some time with the Bible. Um, and indeed, this uh, chapter is is one that's been of, of interest to me. So uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explore uh, and employ a corporate interpretation of the Son of Man sayings in the Gospels. That is, I'm going to be interpreting Jesus' remarks about the Son of Man as referring not to himself exclusively, as it may be assumed, but rather to the eschatological reality of himself together with those who are his. Um, and I will apply this interpretation to Jesus' reference to the Son of Man in Mark 13 and then attempt to draw out its political implications. So the question of the meaning of the Son of Man sayings is, as far as biblical scholarship is concerned, a kind of Bermuda Triangle. Um, those who enter sometimes mysteriously never return. Um, and those who do make it out are haunted by its perplexity. They can't seem to come to a consensus about what they saw. These are, I think, signs that we may have found a window into the mystery of God. So there are various interpretations put forward by biblical scholars. Um, Delbert Burkett provides an excellent summary of the competing theories in his book, The Son of Man Debate, A History and Evaluation. Notable among them are um, John Dominic Crossan's belief that the phrase, the Son of Man, uh, is Jesus' way of naming human beings in general, including himself, um, such as the phrase is used, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, or, for example, in Psalm 8, 4, right? What is man that you are mindful of him, the Son of Man that you care for him? Uh, Rudolf Bultmann's belief uh, that Jesus referred to the Son of Man as an individual other than himself, one who would come to judge eschatologically, um, and that the authors of the New Testament later on came to conflate Jesus and the Son of Man. Uh, there's also uh, Geza, uh, Geza Vermesh, his argument that Jesus, is, uh, Jesus uses this phrase to refer exclusively to himself um, in a third-person circumlocution. And finally, uh, Dale Allison uh, and his argument for a corporate interpretation, that the phrase comes from the apocalyptic vision of Daniel 7, in which the prophet sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds to the ancient of days as the symbolic representative of the whole of God's people, such that Jesus' use of the phrase indicates that he intends both himself in Israel and himself as Israel. Um, no one of these interpretations um, accounts for every saying in the Gospels, and I should say that now. Um, I don't think that any one of these actually can account for every single Son of Man saying. Um, nevertheless, I think this latter one put forward by Dale Allison is the most convincing, and so I'm going to employ it as a theological premise and try to see if it works. We'll see. I'm going to try to display that it does, I think, work as a productive critical theory, if you will, of the biblical text with a particular view to the theopolitics of Mark 13. So I suggest that Jesus' apocalyptic use of the Son of Man in Mark 13 understood corporately frames the church's political agency Christologically and eschatologically. The church acts with Christ, and whatever its political action, it has a sharing in Christ's overthrow of the nations. Such an interpretation of the Son of Man accords with Robert Jensen's eschatological ecclesiology, his understanding of the church in the eschaton as the totus Christus, the whole Christ. So like many parish priests, I read the Bible uh, each week, hopefully, in order to find out what I'm supposed to say. And in those pages of scripture, I find that strange new world that Karl Barth told us about, a world that is always strange and always new, with scattered bits of material throughout that hint at something mysterious and troubling. And like many theologians, I find sometimes that biblical scholars either pass over these strange bits of material or produce 
interpretations that are not compelling or theologically nonsensical, sometimes both. Um, and while I do not believe that there is a single coherent New Testament theology, I believe its various theologies have enough in common for us to identify and develop a broadly coherent Christian theology. The eschatological portions of the New Testament, as well as certain of its apocalyptic portions, do invite us to develop a somewhat coherent Christian vision of the world and its future. Among those portions of scripture, there is a set of eschatological remarks that are very strange and troubling, which I believe the corporate son of, a corporate interpretation of the Son of Man sayings may help to elucidate. Specifically, I refer to the claims about the role of human agents in the eschaton, and more precisely, the role of human agents in bringing about God's kingdom. These texts point towards, but do not elaborate, a mode of eschatological political agency. Three examples suffice. First, consider Jesus' statement to the disciples as recorded in Matthew's gospel. He says, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Not only does Jesus here use the first-person objective pronoun, me, alongside a reference to the Son of Man, but he indicates that the twelve will sit on thrones to judge with the Son of Man. Second, the book of Revelation in its 20th chapter describes two resurrections, that of the righteous and that of the unrighteous. The first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, is described thus. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Even granting that we might exercise additional or special caution while interpreting a text filled with symbols or metaphorical imagery, it is clear that despite the perplexing feature of two resurrections separated by a thousand years, Christ's, Christ will reign and judge, and when he does, he shares that work of judgment with others. In this instance, not just the 24 elders from chapter 4 of Revelation, but all who have suffered martyrdom because of their faithfulness to Jesus and the word of God. Third, the Apostle Paul elaborates one account of his eschatology throughout the first letter of, uh, to the Corinthians. In the third chapter, Paul suggests that the work which is performed by the church's members is a sharing in the building up of God's temple, and that each one's work will be tested by fire on the day. The work of some surviving and the work of others being burned up. Paul then chastises the Corinthians for their apparent inability to make moral judgments within the church, inferring that such judgments are minuscule compared to those in which they will share eschatologically. He says in chapter 6, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels, to say nothing of ordinary matters? The eschatological thread of the argument culminates in the epistle's 15th chapter, where Paul identifies the kingdom as both a penultimate and an ultimate reality. Then comes the end when he, Christ, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. The reign of Christ in this text signifies, as Jürgen Moltmann has repeatedly and correctly observed, warfare against his enemies, which God has already put in subjection under the Lord's feet by his resurrection from the dead. 
And when the Lord will have destroyed all of his enemies, then his reign will also have come to an end. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Paul's construal of what is and what is yet unrealized illuminates all that proceeds in the letter. The church and its members share in the work of Christ, and their work is to build and to judge. And when their work is finished, their eschatological act is, together with the Son, to hand over this work to the Father. Christ is the final Adam, who, unlike the first, returns the creation to its creator, so that he may truly receive it. And he does this with all who are his. The church will inherit the kingdom because they have a sharing in Christ's humanity, in his body, a body that, in the end, will be a spiritual body, since flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we face a choice. One option is to avoid an interpretation of such texts that would move in the direction of so-called realized or perhaps more humbly anticipated eschatology, as Jensen would prefer it, and instead to interpret such texts as metaphors of symbolic power. Another option is to entertain the idea that God has determined that we human creatures will play a part in the Lord's final act. The second option, which is more adventurous and risk-laden, requires an expansive understanding of Christ's work, that he does not act alone, but rather acts with and through those who are members of him. Douglas Knight elaborates exactly such an expansive Christology in his difficult and rewarding work, The Eschatological Economy, describing the whole work of creation as the work of God becoming flesh, and in so doing, bringing human creatures into concert with him in his work as members of his body. This is the sort of Christology that I believe these particular passages of scripture require if we are to properly inhabit them. However, apparent theological necessity hardly justifies any one interpretation of a text. Um, And beyond the problem of interpretation is the problem of the texts themselves. I think we should ask, What theologically authorizes the apostle to call the church Christ's body? What authorizes John to promise that the martyrs will act as eschatological judge with Christ? Is this a fitting sequel to the ministry of Jesus? The interpretation I propose, which puts in Christian hands a dangerous amount of power, must be willing to converse with a hermeneutic of suspicion confronting the possibility that the nascent church's claims about itself and its coming reign with Christ were claims to power, claims that replaced humble Jesus with a grand institution and its conquering mascot, claims that are fantasies of power or sentiment of the disadvantaged community. The Christian theologian, or indeed the preacher, is well served by historical criticism at this juncture. Jesus' son of man sayings, if they do refer to Christ together with his people, are an antecedent in Jesus' ministry of the church's nascent and even more developed ecclesiology, and also provide a basis for ecclesial self-criticism, even as the church makes lofty claims about itself. Jesus is not averse to using first-person pronouns, including alongside the phrase, the Son of Man. A significant example from Mark's Gospel comes from chapter 14. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Even if, for example, Matthew's gospel in its 16th chapter seemingly identifies the Son of Man as Jesus singularly, we may still ask the speculative historical question of what Jesus himself may have meant by it, and not only what the authors of the gospels intended. And the two can be different without necessarily being contradictory or mutually exclusive. In the case of Mark 14, Jesus could just as easily have said, I am and you will see me seated at the right hand of power. But instead, he invoked the Son of Man, 
alluding to the seventh chapter of Daniel. Jesus' use of Son of Man in Mark 13 also alludes to Daniel 7, which is, I am suggesting, the source of the phrase in Jesus' thinking. In Daniel 7, the prophet receives a vision and, conveniently, an angel to, pr- to interpret it. In Daniel, uh, like Daniel 2, Daniel 7 describes four successive empires, generally understood to be Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, this time represented by four beasts rather than four kinds of metal, as in Daniel 2. At the end of the vision in Daniel 2, a great stone, God's everlasting kingdom, destroys the empires and comes to fill the earth. In Daniel 7, the four beasts succeed one another until the fourth beast, which is more horrible than the first three, with a horn that speaks boastfully until it provokes divine judgment. The Ancient of Days, surrounded by thousands of attendants, opens the books and sits to execute judgment. The fourth beast is put to death, and then the prophet sees that with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And he was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. When the prophet asks the meaning of the vision, one of the attendants tells him, as for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The prophet observes that this horn made war with the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient of days came. Then judgment was given for the holy ones of the Most High, and the time arrived when the holy ones gained possession of the kingdom. And again, the attendant tells the prophet, the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be, shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. The one like a son of man in Daniel 7 is not an individual, but is, like the four beasts, a representative of a kingdom, this time that of the holy ones of God, who were dominated by the beasts, but prevailed by God's judgment. The coming with the clouds of the one like a son of man to the ancient of days is an image of victory and coronation for the people of God. Perhaps this is the reason why the son of man is never, is not ever used as a Christological title in the New Testament. Um, It blossoms into the New Testament's theology of the church as a sharing in Christ's very body. The dominant Christian interpretation of the Son of Man coming on the clouds as a description of the second coming of Christ generally misses this corporate dimension of the designation, and I think understandably so, since it seems that Mark 13, along with Matthew 24 and Luke 21, all blend together apocalyptic description of the victory of Christ over death, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, and the parousia. Note also that in Daniel's vision, the one like a son of man appears only at the point of eschatological victory. If Jesus' references to the son of man are intended to evoke this one like a son of man, then it is actually sensible, I think, to agree with Boltmann that the son of man is, in Jesus' usage, principally an eschatological figure. And we may infer that Jesus' messianic self-understanding is informed by this Danielic vision of victory over the beasts. The question becomes, then, the manner of this victory. Daniel's vision sees the Ancient of Days sit in judgment, and the verdict is that the holy ones of God are vindicated and the arrogant beast is put to death. What is Jesus' understanding of the Son of Man's victory? The Mark and Son of Man sayings culminate in chapters 13 and 14, both of which invoke this vision of Daniel 7 of the Son of Man coming with the clouds in glory and power. In both chapters, Jesus promises the glorification of the Son of Man in the context of crisis. In chapter 13, the troubles that are to come upon Jerusalem, and in chapter 14, the trial of Jesus by the high priest, the central religious figure in Jerusalem. It is no surprise, then, 
that the preceding Son of Man sayings center around Jesus' predictions about the Son of Man's betrayal, suffering, rejection, and death. Three or four times, depending on how you count them, Jesus predicts that the Son of Man is to be betrayed, killed, and rise again. Perhaps most significant for our purposes now is the Son of Man saying recorded at the end of Mark 8. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their, for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Again, we see that the final picture of the Son of Man is that he is the one who comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. But this is the same one who must undergo great suffering and be rejected, killed, and after three days rise again. And when Peter contests this experience of the Son of Man, Jesus not only rebukes Peter, but then switching to the first-person pronoun says that if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. No one is called to be a follower of the Son of Man, nor to take up the cross and follow the Son of Man. It is plausible that Jesus, understanding the Son of Man as a renewed Israel constituted around himself, believed that he would go to Jerusalem to suffer death, and that those who followed him would join him in this death and be raised with him. A Christian theological response to this suggestion that Jesus was speaking literally and not metaphorically when he called on his disciples to take up their crosses to follow him, that together they would be the Son of Man, might be that it is in God's providence that Jesus dies alone, that his abandonment by his disciples is part of the anguish of his passion, that it was part of what had to happen, that he was alone the first fruits of those who have died. Yet I also rush to add that the theology of the New Testament is not that Jesus died so that his disciples would not need to, but that Jesus died so that his disciples might die with him, even if only after the fact. What precedes in Mark's gospel the predictions that the Son of Man would suffer rejection and death are three claims about the Son of Man. That the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, that because the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath, and that the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. These sayings, too, may be read ecclesially. They are true of the individual Jesus, and so true of those who are his own, with whom he is the Son of Man. The church exercises authority on earth to judge, and so to forgive sins. The church is free to rest and to work. The church exists for the life of the world. The penultimate end of this way of the Son of Man, of judging and forgiving, of exercising divine rule, of being greatest by serving, is rejection, suffering, shame, and death. And the ultimate end of this way is the apocalypse of life, glory, power, and kingship. More specifically, this way of the Son of Man is his way of defeating the blasphemous arrogation of the beastly powers. The Son of Man subjects himself to violence, trusting in the surety of God's judgment and vindication. 
The victory of the Son of Man is not won by conquest. His victory is an uprising. It is common enough in theological discourse to observe that, Christ's, that Christ suffers shame before he is revealed in glory, and that the disciples of Jesus likewise face suffering in the hope of sharing in Christ's glory. This reality is the major theme of Romans 8, for example. It is the application to the political that is strange. If we do take Jesus' Son of Man sayings as non-exclusively self-referential, as denoting himself as he has others involved in himself, as sharing in his person, then we not only have a historical basis in Jesus' own teaching for apostolic and later more developed ecclesiology, but we are in fact saddled with the highest sort of ecclesiology, a conception of the church as so sharing in Christ's person that its principal self-understanding politically is eschatological. As Christ rose from the dead victorious over every power, so too the church sharing in his person is perpetually this uprising in the world against beast-like powers, whether they are states or parties or corporations or banks. To these we must say, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. The church is God's uprising in the world the one in the world for whom God will judge and whom God will vindicate and reveal in glory. But is this a politics? Mark's gospel records Jesus as saying, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. This chapter of the gospel refuses to be pinned down to a particular moment in time. And historical critical speculation about what Jesus really meant and what was later put into his mouth is actually unhelpful at this point because the ambiguity about time is obviously the point. Jesus' own use of Daniel's vision of one like a son of man is no less obviously a revision of the particularities of the prophet's vision. Broadened, and broadened into a messianic view of created time generally. All that there is, is this generation, and this generation will always have a beast, whether the Greeks or Goldman Sachs. Jesus' words are as he says they are. They will not pass away. And since the Son of Man is risen, since he has already come in the clouds with great power and glory, and since we nevertheless still await his coming in the clouds, the church's politics is, I think, at least three basic tasks beyond the obvious work of telling the beasts that they're about to die. In keeping with Jesus' words about the coming of the Son of Man, our work first is the gathering of the elect, evangeliz evangelization and ecumenism. The gathering of the elect is an eschatological reality, not, ecclesially speaking, a primordial one. To the degree that the church dares to think of itself as a realized or anticipated eschatology, it must hold fast to the truth that its being is eschatological. The church is what it is by hope. The suffering Son of Man is the Son of Man in glory by anticipation, not because these aren't actually different moments in God's work of creation. So too the church. Our glory is not in our grasp. Second, the church must discern its time without presuming to know the time. The church follows Jesus to the cross with the promise of sharing in his resurrection. The church cannot decide that now is the time of our glorification. We can only discern whether or not now is the time to die. The church must exercise its authority to judge and to forgive, to decide when to work and when to rest, 
to devote itself to ruling by service. It must carry on its life as Christ's humiliated and mutilated body until such time, until such time unknown to us, when God will sit in judgment and so invite us into eschatological judgment with him. Mark 13 records the Lord saying, But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. Finally then, when we have discerned our time, we must allow ourselves to die. Our membership in the Son of Man is our conformity to him in his death. That which has power in this world is that which holds the power of life and death. We are those who have no fear of death, and so, we, and so we are those who are not beholden to any power. Nor, if we accept this reality, are we bound to wield the power of death, even if this is exactly what we have done over and over again. Our ecclesiology places us under no compulsion to wield power in this way. We are free to join the martyrs, for it has been given to us to judge the world. So, we look for the coming of the Son of Man, knowing that this is for us a path of suffering and rejection and death, and the burden of power to judge and to speak, to forgive and to serve. This way of the Son of Man is the Lord's uprising among us. So keep awake. Thank you.